It's great to be here hearing about all the exciting things that go on. Most of my time uh, is spent in mobile health research and, and uh, thinking about data sharing for clinical trial studies. But every Wednesday afternoon, I have clinic. My patients are mostly elderly, they're Chinese speaking, they're very underserved. And when I close that clinic door, none of this stuff gets there. So our question is, our question is to move to the next slide. There we go. How can mobile health be an effective part of real-time frontline care? What is it going to take? And this is a little... OK. So let's first think about what the key tasks are in, uh, in clinical care. There's diagnosis, there's treatment, and there's monitoring. And mobile health provides some very valuable information for all three of those tasks, in some sense, more valuable than electronic health record data. Let me try and make that case. In an average month, out of 1,000 people, about 200 visit a doctor's office. About 20 visit an outpatient uh, hospital clinic. About eight are admitted, and fewer than one are admitted into an academic medical hospital uh, like Stanford. Which means, and I'm going to need to go back one slide, please. Uh, OK, just leave that there. Which means that um, uh, the electronic health record only covers part of the whole picture. It only has data for part of the whole picture of health. And if we look at the electronic health record of academic medical centers like Stanford or UCSF, where I practice, okay, uh, this is not working very well. Um, Imagine the, the uh, red circle being at the very lower right-hand corner. We're really looking at, at just a very, very small part of the, of the whole tapestry of, of health. And you might say that that's where all the um, illness is, but that's not really true. Chronic diseases account for 70% of the uh, causes of death in the U.S. and 84% of costs which means that mobile health, because it's out there, chronic disease by definition is 24-7, where we work, live, and play, that's where mobile is, outside of the reach of the electronic health record. And so mobile have a, has a great part to play in helping us diagnose diseases, but it's also important because the primary causes of, of uh, uh, chronic diseases tend to be behavioral. Inactivity, we've heard a lot about that today, poor nutrition, smoking, alcohol over, overuse, and these are all areas where mobile has a particular role to play because of these personal technologies that can text you, buzz your thigh, reward you, uh, to get you to improve your health behaviors and to improve your disease management. And of course, we heard also from Dr. Carsonson that you, know, you want to set goals when you do behavior change. These are very personal goals. And you want um, feedback. You want uh, data to tell you how you're doing. Uh, I think it's getting better or getting worse. So that brings in the monitoring aspect. So today I want to focus on mobile health uh, for treatment and monitoring, primarily for chronic diseases. As a primary care doctor, that's what I see the most of. And because chronic disease is very behavioral, the use of mobile health to support behavior change and chronic disease management. So we think of mobile health then. Mobile health can help improve health comes in two ways. One is through uh, M health interventions that improve self-care with behavior change and with self-management, and also the data itself that comes from health. We've heard a lot about data uh, in, the, in the last uh, in, in today, uh, and it's to provide that data-driven insight that supports self-care and better outcomes. Now, where does that data come from? Clearly, it comes from passive sensors. We've heard about some very interesting ones just in the last talk, but also active self-report apps that uh, you know. Uh, uh, pest you to, to report your pain or your, uh, or your, your depression level, uh, your fatigue level, for example, uh, many other innovations there, but there's generally the passive sensors and the active self-report. Now, the issue, though, is that there are over 100,000 apps out there now on the Apple Play Store or the, uh, and, and, and the Apple Store and the Play Store, and most of these apps are addressing only one disease at a time. That's how they're built. They're addressing migraines, or they're addressing uh, uh, you know, nutrition. But over one out of four Americans have more than one chronic disease. And health being as complex and as individualized as it, as it is, we often need to bring together our own unique combination of data, really outside of any app. We don't want to be trapped in what the app thinks we need for data. We want our own, our own combination. 
You over here might be wanting to look at sleep, physical activity, or blood pressure. Another person might want pain, anxiety, or caloric intake. It may change. What you need today is not what you need tomorrow. So we need to combine different data from different uh, sources, regardless in some sense of the sensor of the app. So long as it's validated information, we really just want the data. And we want smart sense making, and we want personalized clinical insights that help both the doctor and the patient together to make sense and to do a, a joint, uh, joint treatment. So the data flow diagram now looks like this. We have device agnostic data capture from sensors and from active self-report. The data comes together and it drives both uh, clinical insight and insight for the patient and their family to provide self-care and better outcomes. So in this picture, data integration and data analytics is really the heart of the digital health promise. It's not so much the apps, but the first value is the data. So how do we talk about getting data into the clinical care process? So my postulate is that we need to be describing mHealth data rather than apps. Now, what does that look like? So here's a, a screenshot from Link, which is a product we've been, uh, we're testing with uh, Mike McConnell here at Stanford. Uh, it's it's a, a platform for data prescription. And it's a really a very uh, simple idea, data prescription. It's actually one that those of your clinicians, you do this a lot, actually, I do it. Um, a patient that I'm starting on a blood pressure pill, I'll start on a lower dose and aim to titrate up, which means that I want to track their blood pressure a couple weeks later and see if they're reaching goal. The way it happens now, I ask them to come back to have a blood pressure check with their nurse, and sometimes they don't come back. So, so a month or several months might go by, and I've missed the opportunity to titrate up. And of course, here, with sensors, maybe there'll be risk sensors in the near future uh, that we can prescribe with the patient. Check your blood pressure once a day in the morning for two months. Okay? We can be very clear about the goals, and I would want to be notified three weeks from now if the average blood pressure is higher than the goal, and I'll get an alert, and I'll know to increase the, the, the dosage. Okay? Very simple idea. Now, we call this a data prescription, but it's really not a prescription in the sense that we might normally think. It's really a conversation. It's really a joint prescription, a joint discussion with the patient about what data we want to track and why we want to track and what we do with the information. So here we might be thinking about, do we want to track moderate activity and what does that mean? And this prevents that data deluge of, you know, all this data coming at me that I don't actually want and I don't know what to do with. Here it's an explicit discussion about what data we want and what is the value of that data. And, and that's all. I don't need to worry about whether it is a SIM band or a, a, a Jawbone or a Fitbit or, or whatnot. Um, the patient gets an invitation on their phone to sign up, and effectively they bring their own device. Okay? So that's taken care of. And then I get data back, and the patient gets data back in ways that make sense for them and for me in a device agnostic way, so we just focus on the data. And we use the data in the way in clinical care that I use other data now. I can prescribe a potassium, I can prescribe a CT scan, I don't need to worry about the brand of the, of the lab machine, right? I just need that data because I have a clinical question and it's helpful to me. So when we can make mHealth data nothing special, when we, we can make it just like ordering a potassium, then we can really get it into our, into our life. So what are the barriers to data prescription? Um, there are data standards uh, that we need. And I want to go into the example of minutes of moderate activity. 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity activity is what we want. We know how important it is. But the data uh, is uh, built out in silos right now, and actually, they all represent the data differently. Fitbit, for example, represents fairly active minutes. It's hard to find out what that really means. It's hard to map that to the American Heart Association guidelines. Google Fit tells us what uh, kind of activity it is. So maybe let's look at road biking. I know the duration. I can infer the METs, which is a measure of energy expenditure, by looking up like a compendium of physical activities, for example. So four METs if we're cycling at 10 miles an hour, or 15 METs if we're racing at 20 miles per hour but not drafting, or if you're unicycling, it's uh, five METs. We could do that, or we could look at Health Kit, where we have uh, the workout activity type, which we don't really need because we have the start time and the end time and the distance, we can convert that to METs, okay? Now, actually, the data is all there for each of these different devices, but even something which is seemingly as easy as give me the minutes of moderate activity. We have loads of these activity monitors out there. It is still actually really hard. So we do need common data elements for mobile health. That's where OpenAMP Health comes in. Open source schema is a common way to express clinically useful data. 
We're building upon clinical data standards we all know and love, like ICD and SNOMED, so we can integrate with the electronic health record. And we're working with industry and academia to co-evolve both common data elements and methods uh, for getting at some of these new measures that we want to get a better handle on, like stress and mood and so forth. Now, the other big uh, barrier to having mobile health useful in uh, frontline clinical care is integration into that care. And this is the point where most people ask me, well, how are we going to get mHealth data into the electronic health record? Maybe you're thinking about something like this. mHealth data goes into the HR database, which then gets us into clinical care. And I would say, actually, that's the wrong question. The electronic health record is two things. It is a database, and it is a workflow tool. What we really, really need is for the mHealth data to go into our clinical workflow. That's the most important question. To the extent that the workflow comes through the EHR, and for most clinicians nowadays of adoption up at 90%, the EHR is the workflow tool that we have to work with. And as we know, it is a problematic technology, but you know, we need to embrace it. But do we really need to put the mHealth data into the EHR database? I mean, we've been thinking, we've been hearing all day about how it's a silo, data goes and doesn't come out. Why do we need to put it in there? So let's think carefully, does it really need to go there, or is it more important that it goes into the workflow? I think it's more important that it goes into the workflow. So what might it look like? How do we prescribe data more than apps? First is to set up where you can order mHealth data just like any other data we use, nothing special. So in many of our EHRs, it'd be in an order tab, you know, you can't set up an order, the order goes out to uh, something like a link platform. The patient brings their own device, okay? Now there's a whole business there for setting up people with their own devices, but as new devices come on, online, you know, that needs to be managed. But me as a frontline clinician cannot be worrying about what is the latest blood pressure cuff and whether it's a wrist monitor or whether or whatnot. I, I just cannot be dealing with that, okay? I need that sort of offloaded. But so the patient wants to, you know, whatever they got for Christmas, that's what they want to use, right? Uh, they want to bring their own device. The device agnostic data capture, the data goes to a database that is not part of the EHR. It may be the same database as the one where the genomic data is kept. Um, EHR is one of many databases that can be aggregated. It is not the only database where all data needs to go into. And the benefit of having patient-generated data in its own database is that now other parties, third parties, not just the EHR itself, but third parties can build visualization, uh, analytics, predictive modeling, all the great things that you hear about here that the big data has made possible. It can then alert clinicians through the workflow, right, into the messaging inbox. It can generate clinician uh, insight through uh, uh, data-driven uh, visualizations. The, that kind of um, presentation can float on top of the EHR encounter, right? So in clinic, face-to-face, -face, I get that insight, but it's not, it's not embedded in the EHR because that's very problematic. And most importantly, the data can also go back to the, to the patient for data-informed self-care, and it closes the loop by which patients and doctors can work together to improve behavior change, to improve uh, chronic disease management, and to, uh, and to improve care outcomes. Thank you.